In this unit, we're going to study the chemistry of ethers, thiols, and sulfides, and a particular class of ethers that are relatively reactive, known as epoxides. And by and large, what we're going to do here is apply reactivity types and, and modes of reactivity we've seen previously to these specific functional groups. Although the thiols bring in some uh, new reactivity, sulfides as well, associated with the sulfur atom. The fact that it's a third row atom, it's a little bit bigger, and it's susceptible to oxidation means it can do things that oxygen, one step up on the periodic table, definitely cannot do. Although in many ways, the reactivity of oxygen and sulfur in organic compounds is analogous. So first, we're going to start with ethers and epoxides, learning how to recognize these structures, the general structure of the ether functional group. We'll see how we can prepare ethers using nucleophilic substitution and alkene addition reactions, some of which we've already seen. We'll talk about the reactivity of ethers, which is really not much in the grand scheme of things. Acidic cleavage requires very vigorous conditions, and auto-oxidation is generally a very slow process that we don't do on purpose, but that we do need to watch out for as we'll see. The one exception to this ethers are not very reactive idea is epoxides. And we'll review how to make epoxides in this unit. And we'll also learn how to use epoxides in reactions as electrophiles. The carbons linked to oxygen in an epoxide are uniquely reactive because the epoxide is a three-membered ring with quite a bit of strain that can open upon nucleophilic attack, like you see right here. And so epoxides are reactive with nucleophiles, and we get interesting products out of this with two functional groups linked to adjacent carbons. We'll also discuss thiols and sulfides, and we'll learn to predict the products of reactions of thiols and sulfides. We've seen these to some extent previously. For example, thiolates as nucleophiles in SN2 reactions. But sulfur is also susceptible to oxidation, and we'll see examples of that in this unit. And then finally, we'll see how epoxides fit into multi-step synthesis, primarily as part of either an anti-dihydroxylation strategy or a synthetic strategy where we want to install a hydroxyl group or oxygen-containing functional group adjacent to some other heteroatomic functional group, which we can achieve through nucleophilic uh, substitution ring opening of an epoxide. So first off, let's touch on what an ether is. An ether contains an oxygen atom linked to two carbon groups, and these might be alkyl, alkenyl, aryl, or even alkynyl groups. And those groups are linked via single bonds to a central oxygen atom. So a general structure for an ether looks like this. Now because of this structural pattern with two OC bonds, single bonds, we have a dipole moment in the general direction of the oxygen. So ethers in general have a dipole. And they're really ubiquitous in organic compounds. All the structures you see here, melatonin, morphine, vitamin E, floxetine, tamoxifen, and propranolol, all contain ethers. And, and generally, these are not very reactive. Ethers tend to be a kind of structural unit, often linking two fragments together with a lot of carbon-carbon bonds. And these typically do not break apart, except under very, very vigorous conditions. From a physical properties point of view, ethers tend to have lower melting and boiling points than comparable alcohols because they can't hydrogen bond, other things being equal. For example, if we compare ethanol, dimethyl ether, and propane, ethanol has the highest boiling point in this series and propane the lowest because it only has London dispersion forces. Ethanol's boiling point is the highest due to its hydrogen bonding, while dimethyl ether cannot hydrogen bond with itself. It only has dipole-dipole forces that are relatively weak, so it boils below zero degrees C. Now, because ethers um, tend to be unreactive, and once we get enough carbons in there, tend to exist as liquids at room temperature, they're often used as solvents in organic reactions, and three common examples are shown here. There's diethyl ether, or ET2O, tetrahydrofuran, or THF, and 1,4-dioxane, which contains two ether groups in the structure. All three of these compounds are, are quite stable to many different types of organic reaction conditions and are all liquids at room temperature. Diethyl ether kind of barely a liquid at room temperature, but uh, in this respect, they serve well as organic solvents. They're also polar, right? So they have the, the ability to solubilize polar organic reactants and sometimes even ionic compounds. This slide just touches on a rather unique class of polyethers known as the crown ethers. These uh, were developed as cations 
anionic chelators. They contain a large number of these ether oxygens that can grab onto a metal cation at the center. You can see an electrostatic potential map of a crown ether right here. We can see that in the center we've got a very Lewis basic region in here that can fit a Lewis acidic cation right in the middle there. And crown ethers in, in solvating these cations can bring the anions into solution in solvents that would otherwise not be able to dissolve the ionic solute. So for example, potassium fluoride, KF, is definitely not soluble in benzene. That would make it very hard to run this reaction with this extremely oily, extremely greasy, you know, long hydrocarbon chain, very nonpolar alkyl bromide in a solvent like benzene. However, if we include 18 crown 6, we can get this reaction to go because the 18 crown 6 surrounds the potassium cation, solubilizes it, and the F minus anion comes into solution as well and very quickly reacts as a nucleophile given that it's not very well solvated in the nonpolar solvent benzene. So crown ethers are sometimes used to bring in kind of stubborn ionic uh, nucleophiles into nonpolar solutions. To make ethers, the most common approach uses nucleophilic substitution, SN2 or in some cases SN1. The SN2 preparation of ethers is known as the Williamson ether synthesis. And the idea here is we make an alkoxide, RO minus, and then treat that with an alkyl halide or sulfonate to establish the oxygen carbon bond with oxygen serving as the nucleophile and the carbon linked to the good leaving group serving as the electrophile. Now, this is an SN2 mechanism. In fact, the example at the bottom of the slide here shows this. We first deprotonate with a base like sodium hydride. This makes the alkoxide, and then we treat with this alkyl halide electrophile. Here it's a methyl halide, and the product is a methyl ether with the byproducts being Na plus and X minus. So the key step really that forms the carbon oxygen bond is this one, and it's an SN2 step, right? Bimolecular nucleophilic substitution, concerted formation of the OC bond, and cleavage of the CX bond. Because this is an SN2 step, it is critical that the alkyl halide be primary or methyl. If it's not, something else is going to happen. So let's consider what would happen if we tried to take this general alcohol R1OH, deprotonate it with sodium hydride, and then treat it with a tertiary alkyl halide like tert butyl bromide. What do you think would happen here? Pause the video and think this through. All right, if you said E2 elimination would occur, good thinking. And this is not what we want to happen, right? Since this would not form an ether, in fact, it would return the alcohol and would generate isobutylene in this particular case as the product via E2 elimination. Rather than substituting at this highly uh, hindered carbon, very sterically hindered carbon, we get deprotonation of a beta carbon and elimination of, of Br minus, and we do not want that. And this is why the electrophile must be primary or methyl to avoid competing E2 elimination in the Williamson ether synthesis. It's also important to note that we cannot make bonds to sp2 or sp hybridized carbons using the Williamson method. It's only appropriate for the synthesis of alkyl ethers, in fact, ethers with a CH2 group linked to the oxygen due to this SN2 mechanism. We can also create ethers using alkene addition reactions and adapt a reaction we've seen previously, oxymercuration, demercuration, to establish an alkoxy group rather than a hydroxy group. And all we have to do to adapt the reaction is swap out water, which was the nucleophile in oxymercuration, with an alcohol, which is the nucleophile in alkoxymercuration. And this is a Markovnikov method, so the alkoxy group ends up linked to the more substituted carbon in the alkene, and H to the less substituted carbon, and this occurs without carbocation rearrangement, so there's no carbocation intermediate in involved. So for instance here, notice first of all that the products are ethers. We have an OR group linked to a carbon, we've got two carbon groups linked via single bonds to an oxygen, these are ethers. And just to touch base on the mechanism here, the idea is we first form a mercurinium ion like this, and then the nucleophile comes in and opens this um, cyclic intermediate at the more substituted carbon through SN2-like electron flow like this. We lose a proton from that oxygen and we end up here with this alkoxy mercury intermediate. And in the second stage of the reaction, sodium borohydride is used to replace the mercury group with a 
hydrogen. So the mechanism here is identical to what we've already seen for oxymercuration with water. It just uses ROH and alcohol as the nucleophile as opposed to water. So we get here a relatively substituted um, ether with the oxygen linked to the more substituted carbon in the original alkene. When it comes to the reactivity of ethers, there's really not a ton to say. Ethers are more or less unreactive under basic, neutral, and mildly acidic conditions. However, if we put an ether in very strong acid with a decent nucleophile like a halide anion around, cleavage of the ether can occur, and this acidic cleavage reaction is one way to make alkyl halides, although there are others that are better than this, in my opinion. But it's a reaction that you may see. So the ether R groups can kind of be thought of as electrophilic, imagining this oxygen as a potential leaving group. Now the oxygen of an ether generally is not a good leaving group. We're not going to kick off OR- as a leaving group in the majority of cases, especially in organic chemistry 1. Um, however, if we protonate that oxygen, all of a sudden we've turned that now OH plus group into a good leaving group. And if that also generates a decent nucleophile like X minus, that nucleophile can form bonds to the electrophilic R groups in the ether. So here we get potentially two alkyl halides if the blue and red are, uh, blue and purple rather R groups are not the same, and we get water as a byproduct of this reaction. And so it is important here that the R groups be alkyl groups. This will not work uh, well at all if we've got an alkenal or aryl or alkynal ether involved. And chlorine, bromine, and iodine are the typical halogens we see here because HX needs to be a very strong acid. We can imagine an SN1 mechanism for the reaction when the R group is tertiary, and I encourage you to pause and draw that mechanism on your own. I'm going to show the SN2 mechanism that operates when these carbons linked to the oxygen are primary. So the first step here is protonation of the ether oxygen, and this is a common theme. When you put an ether in acid, we should entertain the idea that that ether oxygen can be protonated by the strong acid. Now we can think of this entire fragment as a good leaving group. And we've also made X minus, which is a good nucleophile. So notice we're kicking off actually this side of the molecule. Here it doesn't matter which you attack first because they're equivalent. And we make a new X carbon bond and we kick off a molecule of alcohol. So here's our first equivalent of alkyl halide. And we've also made an alcohol byproduct in this SN2 displacement step. If there were more substituents here, this fragment could leave on its own, then we've got a carbocation and an SN1 type mechanism. The exact same process can happen again with the alcohol. And al alcohols can be converted into alkyl halides via treatment with concentrated hydrohalic acid. So what happens here makes sense from that perspective. We're going to protonate the alcohol oxygen, make H2O plus a good leaving group. This also makes X minus a good nucleophile. And so now we have the ingredients for an SN2 elementary step and our second equivalent of alkyl halide as well as water as a byproduct here. So the overall reaction converts the two alkyl groups connected to the ether oxygen into alkyl halides and water is a byproduct. In this practice problem, we're going to predict the neutral organic products when these ethers are treated with concentrated HBr and HI and heat. So the idea in general is that we're going to protonate the ether oxygen and use the conjugate base of the acid as a nucleophile. So we can imagine, for example, in this dialkyl ether that the two CO bonds are going to be cleaved. We're going to add two protons to the ether oxygen to create H2O, and we're going to add two bromides to the carbons linked to oxygen to create two alkyl halide molecules, which in this case happen to be the same. And so we're going to get isobutyl bromide um, out of both sides of this ether, and it looks like we're done. However, one thing we want to consider here is the possibility of formation of a carbocation and 1,2 rearrangement. Now, these are primary alkyl groups. Notice these are CH2s. So we're not going to get a carbocation via direct loss of uh, a leaving group from the protonated ether, right? Something like this is not going to take place. However, 
we can imagine rearrangement with simultaneous loss of the leaving group like this to create a tertiary carbocation. So I wouldn't be surprised here to see a good bit of terp butyl bromide, and this may even be the major product under these conditions because of the propensity to form carbocations under these strongly, strongly acidic conditions. In this case, it would have to happen concertedly with 1-2 rearrangement, but this is not an unreasonable thing to predict and something to look out for here. In the second case, we've got an interesting situation now because we have an alkyl group on one side and an aromatic group or benzene ring on the other side of the ether. So we're not going to want to form a cation at this sp2 hybridized center. The upshot of this is that that side of the ether is not going to react. So we're going to start with the usual mechanism, protonating the ether oxygen. I think it helps a lot here to kind of step through the mechanism step by step. And then we have iodide as a good nucleophile that can come in and attack at the alkyl carbon, the primary alkyl carbon. This makes an alkyl iodine and exposes this OH group. Now, what we've seen previously is we proton out protonate that OH group and then do either an SN2 step or SN1, lose the carbocation and then add the nucleophile. And we could go down that line of, of reasoning, and we will in a second, but what I'm going to tell you first off is that this is the final product. This hydroxyl group does not react further because it's linked to an sp2 hybridized carbon, and no SN1 or SN2 can occur at this carbon. That would require protonation of the oxygen, which is already a bit disfavored, actually, because this oxygen is adjacent to the benzene ring, and so its lone pairs are resonance stabilized. So that's already not a great proposition. But then the next step would involve loss of that H2O plus leaving group, and this would lead to a aryl cation, which is highly, highly unstable. So this is not going to occur under the reaction conditions, or at least it's highly, highly unlikely, meaning where we're going to end up in the final product is right here at this product that contains both an alcohol group and an alkyl iodide. Finally, I feel like no discussion of ether reactivity would be complete without a mention of the oxidation of ethers in air, a reaction known as auto-oxidation or aut-oxidation. And this occurs slowly in air via a radical mechanism. And the products of this reaction, these hydroperoxides, are highly, highly explosive. So you want to be very, very careful with old ether bottles. And if you see solid crystals in those bottles, it's quite frequently these hydroperoxides that have crystallized out, that have formed a solid that is highly, highly sensitive. So be very careful there. The mechanism here is a radical mechanism. And so through some kind of electron flow like this, hydrogen abstraction, we get a radical that is alpha 2 or adjacent to the ether oxygen. This is actually a resonance stabilized radical. This is one reason that ethers do this so readily. That radical can couple with oxygen in the air. And this is how we establish this carbon-oxygen bond and the OO bond, which is built into oxygen, right, in, in the O2 reactant. And this hydroperoxy radical can then abstract a hydrogen from something else, propagating the chain, right? This gets us to the hydroperoxide and generates a new radical, which could go on and react with another molecule of ether, so on and so on and so forth, propagating the radical chain. So these hydroperoxide products, while not important in a practical synthetic sense generally, right, there's, we can't really do much with these um, as synthetic intermediates, for example, or God forbid as final products because they are so sensitive. It's just something to watch out for with ethers, that they can do this kind of oxidation readily, particularly on the time periods of months or years that we sometimes store solvents like THF and diethyl ether.